Growing up, there was always one thing that baffled me. How is it that one cell can grow at the expense of the very body it belongs to, ultimately resulting in its own self-destruction? To understand cancer, we'll need to tell its story, and to do this story justice, we'll have to go back in time to a social revolution that occurred about 800 million years ago. Life up to this point was characterized by a world of single cells, isolated actors pursuing their own self-interest in fierce competition with each other over limited resources. Each cell had a certain kind of perception of self, a computational boundary of self, which just extended to the edge of their cell membrane. But about 800 million years ago, at the dawn of the Metazoan period, certain cells evolved to expand their boundaries of self to include other cells, mainly through physical and electrochemical associations. This allowed for the evolution of more complex, cooperative bodies which could coordinate larger goals on longer timescales. After millions of years of evolution, this pattern gave rise to organisms made up of trillions of cells, like fungi, plants, animals. As developmental biologist Dr. Michael Levin has theorized, cancer emerges through the constriction of the boundary of self back down to the single cell level, which affects how they behave in both space and time. In space, they start to perceive the greater body they belong to as just a foreign environment to exploit for resources. Limited to a single cell's capacities, the timelines of their goals shrink too, constraining them from maintaining the life of the whole organism to pursuing short-term behaviors which end in their long-term destruction. In biological terms, they become disconnected from their tissue's morphogenetic field of information, electrical, physical, and chemical cues which would otherwise help them coordinate with neighboring cells to pursue higher level anatomical goals. Thus, cancer can be understood as a disorder of perception, which allows certain cells to interpret their own body as a site for extraction. But what would cause cells to constrict this perception of self in the first place? To answer this, we'll have to zoom out to the psychology of trauma. As addiction specialist Dr. Gabor Matei explains, trauma is not what happens to you, it is what happens inside of you as a result of an extremely stressful event. One aspect of what happens inside is this connection. Patients report becoming disconnected from their emotions, from their bodies, and from the present moment. Trauma also alters perception. People often develop a negative view of themselves and the world, and are prone to behave defensively towards others. As psychiatrist Dr. Bessel van der Kolk explains, for patients with PTSD, the memory of the past is constantly kept alive in the present, and the body acts as such, modulating endocrine and neurological systems to keep the body in a constant state of defense as if the event never ended. According to this definition, we can understand the narrowing in cancer's boundary of self as a trauma response. Cancer becomes disconnected from its normal identity through dedifferentiation and from its surrounding tissue through physical and electrochemical isolation. It believes or computes it is alone in a hostile world and accordingly activates single-celled programs associated with the genetic hallmarks of cancer. It behaves like it is in a constant survival state, persistently haunted by some past memory. And trauma is a psychological wound that cannot heal in a fractured self. This is the permissive context where addictions emerge. Addiction being defined as any behavior that provides short-term relief with negative long-term consequences. Cancer has also been described as a wound that can't heal, continuously activating regeneration programs, much like a blastema, which provides short-term metabolic needs at the expense of its long-term survival. This growth phenotype also likely emerges from the permissive context of the fractured self. Hinting at this, in 2017, Alarn et al. injected RNA inhibitors for beta-catenin-1 in flatworms and zebrafish, thus disrupting the continuity of the body's patterning signals from head to tail and simulating a fractured self. In this permissive context, a normal wound to the skin was sufficient to cause an ectopic growth, which meant growing eyes or part of a fin in the wrong place. Inappropriate growth results from a wound signal getting interpreted by a tissue with a fractured perception of self. When a cooperative system becomes fractured through trauma, the ground is ripe for a wound to cause an inappropriate regeneration program to attempt to heal that trauma. In psychological space, this is called addiction. In morphogenetic space, this is called cancer. Here's a summary of this conceptual model. Let's call it the trauma-driven tumor model. First, there is the catalyzing event which forces the body into a state of fragmentation. This is the trauma. Second, a local injury triggers the release of wound signals which are interpreted as a regeneration cue in this permissive context of a fractured self. Third, neoplastic growth damages neighboring cells prompting the release of more wound signals and initiating a positive feedback loop. This is why tumors have been described as wounds that do not heal. Now, we should not villainize cancer, as attacking it creates wound signals which perpetuate its growth and traumatize nearby healthy tissue, setting the stage for relapse.
We can only cure cancer by healing the trauma, by re-establishing its connection to self and others. Now, what if cancer is not just a disorder of relations between cells, but a more general disorder that exists in nature across scales of cognition? To answer this, we'll zoom out again, but into anthropology and systems ecology. We start from the following assumption. The Earth is an integrated living body. We can understand this from the metaphysical perspective of Mother Earth or Gaia, or the cybernetic perspective of a living system emergent from the actions and reactions of all living and non-living actors. Within this context, it appears the same perceptual myopia of cancer has taken hold at the scale of human societies and is at the root of the climate crisis. Take for example the juxtaposition of Western and indigenous worldviews. Many indigenous peoples from across the world perceive plants, animals, rivers, and the land itself as relatives, in other words, direct extensions of the self. On the other hand, the Western worldview has historically perceived these non-human beings not as relatives, but as resources. But we all come from ancestors who were indigenous to some place and who were deeply connected to the land. This suggests that the Western worldview was born through a constriction of the boundary of self at the ontological level, which caused us to perceive relatives as resources. From this narrow perception of self emerged an extractive economic system based on the idea that rational individuals act to maximize their self-interest. Such behavior is only rational when you don't perceive the greater communities you depend on as continuous extraction to optimize profit will eventually deplete the regenerative capacity of any system from tissues to forests. The phenotypes of this economic system mimic that of cancer, remodeling ecosystems to direct matter and energy to sites of accumulation, pursuing infinite growth in a finite body, and colonizing distant sites for extraction. Now we experience the symptoms of a civilizational scale cancer as climate change. With our previous framework, we should consider capitalism as an ecological trauma response to starvation as it is undergirded by a negative perception of ourselves as inherently greedy and constantly recreates the memory of scarcity. Though it generates material abundance in sites of accumulation, it creates scarcity in sites of extraction, thus perpetuating the addictive cycle of a non-healing wound and damaging the entire body of the earth long term. Now, to be fair, it's not just capitalism. Socialist and communist countries have also followed similar growth models based on extraction and accumulation and decimated environments. Even though these political economies seem opposite in our very human left-right politics, they each have operated from a narrow conception of the human as separate from nature, and none of them have expanded that conception to treat non-human beings as kinds of persons with agency, rights, and responsibilities. Perhaps we should just call this economic corner extractivism, based on the oncological ontology that turns relatives into resources. But, how can we apply the trauma-driven tumor model to understand why we're in the middle of a climate crisis? The first step, the original trauma at the heart of Western civilization is memorialized in the fall from Eden. The story might point to a real traumatic ecological event which generated the feeling that we could no longer rely on the greater body of the more than human world. This caused an ontological constriction in the boundary of self and led to the anthropocentric worldview that sees humans as separate from nature and as the only actors of the agency in the world. All of the language of original sin and the belief in the inherent greediness of humans is textbook self-blaming psychology in people with trauma. The local injury in this fractured self-context which was interpreted as a regeneration cue may have been the Black Plague. Now this quote is from Francis Bacon from the book Novum Organum in 1620. To generate and superinduce a new nature or new natures upon a given body is the labor and aim of human power. This to me reads like the mission statement of a tumor. The beginning of neoplastic growth. The third step. Seeking to solve scarcity in one place, by physically eroding the earth in another, we damage neighboring communities and ecosystems, causing actual scarcity, which justifies the foundational logic and continued expansion of this economic model. This is another positive feedback loop that has led to the neoliberal order we have today. Now, this is critically not to villainize capitalism, but to contextualize it appropriately as a trauma response so that we can respond accordingly. Attacking capitalism only further entrenches it as wound signals cause proliferation, which is why anti-capitalist discourse that seeks to attack the symptoms rather than to heal the underlying trauma is doomed to fail. To truly become post-extractivist and return to a world based on sharing, gifting, and community, we have to heal our relationships to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. Okay, how do we heal? It seems that Western medicine has not been able to solve cancer for the same reasons Western civilization has not been able to solve climate change. 
These are related phenomena at different scales, and we've lost the necessary concepts from our cosmotechnic repertoire, meaning the possible inventions that we could think up starting from the way that we perceive reality. This is why supporting and learning from indigenous peoples is not only a crucial point of social justice, but a medical obligation and an existential imperative for humanity. We will never defeat cancer by destroying it. We must work to heal its underlying trauma, expanding the tumor's boundary of self so it can reintegrate into the morphogenetic field of the body. One promising route is differentiation therapy, using electroceuticals to modify gap junctions and ion channels to restore the relationships between cancer cells and the broader body, allowing it to self-heal. We should study how methods in trauma therapy at the level of human psychology, such as EMDR and neural feedback, among other methods, can be scaled down to the level of cells to heal the trauma behind cancer. At the human level, could we reintegrate into the morphogenetic field of the ecologies we live in and build our societies as an expression of the land? That may be too cybernetic of a phrasing, but the most promising pathway for healing humanity, I believe, is in this discourse around indigenizing the future, as it has been written about by scholars such as Robin Wall Kimmerer, Daniel Wildcat, Gregory Kahetse, and Four Arrows, to name a few. By no means am I an expert, but from what I've read, there's a few things we can summarize. We must relearn to see the land and beings that inhabit it not as resources, but as our relatives again, and learn from other general principles of indigenous worldviews. Wherever we live today, we must support indigenous peoples and learn traditional ecological knowledge and practices if we can as practical guidance for how to respectfully thrive in a given place. We must reconnect to our own ancestral identities, beliefs, and practices, and combined with local knowledge, we can create something entirely new and appropriate for contemporary times. Lastly, we should pursue what Mi'kmaq elder and scholar Dr. Albert Marshall has called two-eyed seeing, pairing the advantages of Western science and indigenous knowledges for the benefit of all. This is what it means to truly become sustainable, to cure cancer by treating its trauma. In summary, more than just a disease of irreversibly mutated cells, cancer is a disorder of relationships between beings emergent from a fractured perception of self, which is ultimately rooted in trauma. Extractivism should be understood as an ecological trauma response to starvation, which constantly recreates the memory of scarcity in the present. At its core, cancer is deeply lost and wants to come home. Even in its greedy, ecologically disastrous behavior, all it wants is to feel loved, to feel safe, to feel whole again, and it doesn't know how to. Going forward, we must embody a compassion of care, even for the tumor. Now go forward with love, y'all.